And so I just wanted to start by saying sorry, I apologize for not doing this video sooner for those of you who are following the Reader's Guide to Homike Baba's Location of Culture. Thank you for doing that. Um, this video will focus on the fourth chapter, which is Of Mimicry and Man, the Ambivalence of Colonial Discourse. You might have noticed that I skipped it to do Sliceability Chapter 5 first. It's because I um, understand that this is a really important chapter in that even if you maybe don't necessarily know even this book, you at least have probably heard of the concept of mimicry in Baba's work. And the big question is, well, what exactly does that mean? And that's what I hope to take a look at in this video. So really, in order to talk about what he's getting at with mimicry, you need a couple concepts, which um, an engagement with post-structuralist and deconstructivist thought can help us unpack. And one of those is the distinction between representation and repetition. A, a naive view would probably almost think that those two refer to the same thing. The difference is that representation deals with the relation between an origin and a copy in which the basic principle is identity. You have representation of a copy for an origin. A copy can represent an origin and therefore um, preserve its identity as the origin. But repetition is rather than based on the concept of identity, rather something more like what Friedrich Nietzsche was getting at with the concept of the eternal return, as Deleuze notes in his work, uh, Difference in Repetition. So uh, in Nietzsche's eternal return, uh, you at home or wherever you are right now, wherever you are in the world watching this video, uh, you have already watched this video, not, you know, another time in your life. You've already watched it in the last time that the cycle of the eternal return of Nietzsche took place. Nietzsche argued, maybe even just hypothetically, if matter is finite but time is infinite, there was not a beginning of time, a creation. Time is infinite, that means that there has to be a unfortunate repetition of everything that happened within that eternal unfolding of time which means that you have already watched this video, not once, but countless times in that cycle. And the psychological difficulty of the eternal return is asking, is your will strong enough to will to do it all over again? Not once, and not just the good parts, but all of the pain and suffering you've had in your life. Are you willing to do it all again? Because the eternal return is going to ensure that your most difficult moment is going to recur, not once, but countless times in the future. And the idea here is that the eternal return is not the re uh, representation of an origin. It is rather the repetition that is characterized by difference rather than identity. It's repeating, but it's repeating with a difference. And it's repeating without an origin. And that's what Homi K. Baba's argument about um, mimicry is largely going to, be to uh, re rely on a metaphysics of difference and repetition rather than a metaphysics of an origin, copy, and identity. So he really opens up by talking about Edward Said's notion that the uh, tendencies and desires of imperialism have two contradictory goals. On the one hand, there's the desire for panoptical domination, and that is the desire for the um, limits of the empire to continually expand and actually encompass everything, but also to satisfy at the level of the gaze, the desire for um, an image of the empire that provides the identity of the empire through the stasis of an image as a type of snapshot that shows you, you know, offers up epistemologically the image of the empire as something that doesn't change, right? Something for which control of it has been solidified. But at the same time, the imperial desire is for the diachronic unfolding of history as a type of change to take place, the historical shift of progress, the idea that you're moving from the primitivity of the past towards progress in terms of both, you know, gaining more and more territory as time progresses for the empire, but also 
going up in notions of political um, superiority in terms of the nation is supposed to also be advancing towards a more just society, as contradictory, of course, as that desire actually is in terms of the just nation at home conducting imperial business overseas. But the contradiction between both wanting the stasis of panoptical domination um, of, of an image of the empire, but also the unfolding of history, which it necessarily entails change, is met with by the compromise that mimicry provides. And the compromise of mimicry between the contradictory goals of stasis and change between identity and difference is going to play a role throughout the remainder of his discussion of the topic in that mimicry is rather than simply the representation, keep in mind etymologically this is supposed to be the representation of an origin as the copy of it which preserves its identity, is rather repetition that always comes back with a difference, a difference that has the potential to be highly uh, disruptive and to undermine the very foundations of colonialism through, of course, Homi Baba's understanding of the between. Now, of the big deal for Homi Baba is not only that the mimicry which the colonial subject is supposed to engage in undermines the metaphysics of identity, uh, that is, of course, a very um, important component. It's also the intersubject, the intersubjectivity and performative in-betweenness that is the context of mimicry is something which is going to undermine also the colonizer's position. So to put it very briefly, mimicry is the idea that one of the um, regulatory principles of the actual functioning of colonialism is that colonialism requires subjects of colonialism, that is the colonized subjects, to adopt a code of behaviors that makes them anglicized, for example, but still retains that ontological difference from the colonizer there to be anglicized without being English. There is supposed to be that difference at the very level of being that makes them something other than us, and that, of course, is to ensure the political project that the functioning of empire as differentiated from the colonizer to the colonized is able to go on. And what this really means in their idea, the colonizers, is that um, the colonized subject will adopt a certain code of behaviors manifested through stereotypically charged imagery, of course, to be performed within the gaze of the colonizer. It's not enough for this to take place in the absence of the colonizer, rather the whole point of Baba's work is the the encounter, the between that takes place, and yet conceptualized as the formula, let's just say this is A, the formula A plus that excess, that je ne sais quoi, which differentiates them as being other than us, what actually happens is rather than representing um, the identity uh, that it's supposed to, it instead engages in a difference, a repetition of a difference rather than a representation, which calls into question the colonial gaze within the very medium in which the gaze was supposed to solidify control decisively once and for all for the colonizer, turning stereotypical imagery which was meant to degrade the colonized turning, using that imagery as a repetition with difference to undermine the very colonial relation itself. And therefore, the very concept of providing a metaphorical substitution of presence for presence cannot, uh, up, uh, cannot hold up within this context. Instead, there's a notion of metonymy. Metonymy in poetry, of course, is not that which substitutes, but rather that which um, carries over a lack of from one link of the chain to the next. So if you look at the text, he talks about um, there's a type of excess or slippage produced by the ambivalence of mimicry, the requirement that the colonized subject be almost the same, that not, uh, but not quite. And it does not merely rupture the discourse, but becomes transformed into an uncertainty which fixes the colonial subject as itself a partial presence. This is the idea that the... Um, metaphysical commitment to the model of representation 
is that the origin is characterized as a presence. This is work of Jacques Derrida, as I've talked about in other videos, and the idea that the colonizer, at the very least, is enjoying the full presence of the identity of which this is merely a bad copy with an excess, shows that in mimicry, the very presence of the colonizer is also called into question. Rather than being characterized by full presence, it becomes something of a partial presence. Mimicry, therefore, is at once a, a resemblance, right, troublingly so, but also a menace. It not only resembles his identity, but calls into question his very identity as the colonizer. And therefore, the desire for um, a clear, you know, um, substitution of one for the other, but of course with the ontological distinction from me as being an other, is disrupted by the fact that mimicry really emerges as a type of writing. Of course, Jacques Derrida's notion that writing is not merely a bad copy of presence, but is a concept which calls into question the very notion of presence. If writing is that which is neither absent nor present, maybe everything is actually a type of writing. At the very least, the, um, the practice of mimicry is going to fall into being a type of writing as a type of repetition and difference rather than uh, merely a bad copy of the colonizer's presence. And therefore, um, it's going to always be the repetition of partial presences, disruptions of the very notion of presence and origin, and instead the visibility of mimicry as something which is offered up to the colonizer's gaze, but paradoxically disrupts it within that very medium, is going to lead him to talk about mimicry as a type of destruction of the narcissistic authority through a repetitious slippage of difference and a process of fixation of the colonial as a form of class, uh, cross-classificatory and discriminatory knowledge within an interdictory discourse necessarily raises the question of the authorization of those colonial representations in the first place in that um, the practice of mimicry will show identity to be something split inherently, not merely split in the process of moving from here to here, from here to here, but inherently split and in that the colonizer himself doesn't even enjoy a identity that is coherent. It's split um, and inherently ambivalent and the notion of the colonized culture as a fetish, which is supposed to, like Freud's fetish, as I talked about in video three, hide over the uncomfortable fact of difference and the fear of lack. The fetishized culture is actually an insurgent counter appeal. It is a disruption of the colonizer's authority rather than something which satisfies the metaphysics of coherence to hide over the ambivalence at the heart of the colonialist situation. And therefore, the ambivalence of colonial authority is going to repeatedly turn from mimicry, a difference that is almost nothing but not quite, to menace, a difference that is almost total but not quite. So that is going to conclude this video, and uh, look forward to the rest, so stay tuned for the remainder of this